This program is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. In June of 1969, the New York City police were conducting a raid on the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in Greenwich Village. In those days, such raids were routine. But on that night, something different happened. The patrons fought back. Their resistance began the modern movement in this country to end discrimination based on a person's sexual orientation. Tonight, a panel of educators, clergy, legal minds, activists, and politicians, men and women, gay, lesbian, and straight, Jew and Gentile, has come to discuss the struggle for gay and lesbian rights in the context of the ongoing fight against prejudice in this country. I'm Andy Hum. Welcome to Out in America. To begin, a cover story. It shows how the issue of gay and lesbian civil rights can go deep into the heart of the American family. Even in the face of discrimination, the past 21 years has seen more and more Americans willing to be identified as gay and lesbian. Not just to themselves, but to the people around them. The wages of sin is death! And with this increased visibility, issues of discrimination are being faced not just by gays, Sodomy equals death! but by their parents, families, and friends. And the family united shall be our aim. <laughs> to be invisible or not to be, that is the question. Parents have a responsibility to educate themselves, to be well informed, and then to share their information with others. Paulette Goodman is president of the National Federation of Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Directors from across the country meet twice a year to set the national agenda. The group lobbies for full human and civil rights for their gay and lesbian children. Paulette's activism comes after a childhood in hiding. I grew up during World War II in Nazi-occupied France in Paris. And as a Jewish child, I felt all of the oppression and the discrimination and my oldest sister was married and had a beautiful little boy, my first nephew. And we lost them in 1942. They followed her to our apartment house. I was quite young at the time, but I'll never forget. <laughs> my mother pleaded with them, don't take him. I know what's going to happen to him. And the policeman said, if you don't let this child go with us, the Gestapo is waiting downstairs. They're going to come up and take all of you. <laughs> and my mother had to let the child go. <laughs> After the Holocaust, Paulette escaped prejudice and fear. In the United States, she married her husband, Leon. They have two children, one of whom is gay. I really thought that uh, this was the land of the free. And... When I found out that I had a gay child, I went into a closet again as a parent. My child was in the closet as a gay person. And that brought back what we had suffered during the Nazi occupation. And I made the parallel early on that this was the same situation. It was causing fear and anguish. It was oppression. Um, I was afraid for my child. Um, and, and it brought back all these feelings. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. Terry James, the mother of two gay sons, has also known prejudice. When I was growing up in Virginia, of course, I do remember going to uh, water fountains that were marked black and white. When I got older, of course, I started thinking about it. Why is it that I must drink from this fountain and not the other one? When the Civil Rights Movement started, we would hear about the marches. We would hear about Rosa Parks. 
When we heard the Martin Luther King speech, I have a dream, it just sends shivers up and down your spine. A beautiful speech, and it still does. Every time I hear it, uh, I get emotional. The gay and lesbians are going through the same thing. They have to fight for their rights. I think all of us should be concerned about civil rights of all other people, gay, black, Jews, whatever, because what affects one can eventually affect somebody else. I'm, I'm blessed. I realize that I'm blessed um, in having my mother's support. I am very uh, sympathetic for the black families, especially, who do not have the support that I have had. I wish that I could talk to more parents. I wish that I could talk to more black parents. It's very difficult to get them to admit that they have gay children. A large part of my parents' acceptance of me as a gay person and their uh, feeling comfortable with that was my having gotten settled down with my lover, Tom. Uh, we had been together for eight and a half years before he died, and it uh, was a very devastating uh, thing that happened to me and to us. Paul Colfer, a devout Catholic, has found support at Masses Given by Dignity, a national organization that affirms both his Catholicism and his identity as a gay man. Across the country, Paul's parents' experience with their own parish priest led them to dignity as well. It really wasn't until Paul's lover died that we uh, went that far as to share with the clergy. So we waited several weeks and had no answer. So Jerry met him after service one day and said, you don't seem to attach much importance to our plea to do something towards the AIDS crisis. I used to serve as an altar boy for him. And I would see this man day after day after day, and he would never acknowledge that there is this undetermined uh, thing between us. I want our churches and hopefully society, families, to accept our gay people unqualifiedly, love them because they are who they are, and let us keep our families together. Let us keep our families together. The piece showed three families that are very supportive of their gay and lesbian children. Roberta Actenberg, you're a supervisor from San Francisco. You ran on a pro-family platform out there. Is this common in America, families staying together around their gay and lesbian members? It should be more common. Unfortunately, it's not as common as I hope it will become. We try to talk about uh, the nature of the changing family, not just in San Francisco, but around the country. And that family is a group of people who take care of one another, who provide for one another, who can rely on one another in sickness and in health, do the kinds of things for one another that makes life worth living. Heterosexuals, homosexuals, no one has the exclusive lock on what's good family. And we tried to talk about that, not just in my campaign, but our movement, the lesbian and gay rights movement, is trying to let people know uh, that we are desirous and deserving of family, just like all others are. Certainly many members of the panel here are members of gay and lesbian families, the gay and lesbian people who are on the panel. What about in families with heterosexual parents where a child comes out Rabbi Schindler, you're the head of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. Have you counseled people who have come to you who have a gay and lesbian member in their families, and what's the experience been then? Well, I'm not in the active rabbinate, so I'm not involved on a day-by-day -day basis in a counseling situation, but I've encountered it. And uh, uh, what uh, Roberta said is absolutely correct. Uh, the majority do not react as they should. Uh, How should they is, react, Rabbi They Schindler? should uh, respect uh, every family, every family unit that cares. In the final analysis, it seems to me, it is up to God to judge the worth of human relationships and not up to any other member of society. But everybody's uh, looking at the women in that piece. Maybe they're saying it's wonderful. Maybe they're saying, how could they accept them? Is it, is it different in different families? What about in Jewel Gomez? You're a writer, an author, an artist. Is it different in the black family? Well, I think the mythology about what a traditional family is has been so pervasive in this culture for so long. 
um, many people think there is this traditional family, but of course in our society we know that the father, mother, 2.3 children hasn't been the no traditional norm in years. And Afro-Americans have a tradition of extended families um, that involve many, many people. Um, so I grew up expecting to be on the edge where the family is concerned. So being a lesbian and looking to make new family is not a new thing, but I think it's something we can all learn as gays and lesbians. How to recreate the family and, and recreate what mythology is around families. What's been the experience in your family, Mark Loveless? You're from Detroit. You're head of the Michigan Anti-Violence anti Project, Lesbian and Gay Anti-Violence Project. What was your experience there? Was in my family? Yes. Well, um, my family was supportive uh, ever, you know, ever since I came out. I think that... Uh, ever, since, ever since you came out? How did, how did that happen? What happened? Well, I had thought that I had I was out. You know, I was doing television, <laughs> radio, and stuff. And uh, actually, the actual coming out was when I did a television show, and and one member of my family called everyone and said, "Oh, look, he's on television." They didn't they didn't even know what the topic was, and when they caught what the topic was, then it was um, you know it, it, the the response was was great. I got very positive response. But you know, I, you know, one thing to to add on to what Jewel is saying is that. There is there's a sort of a role that uh, uh, lesbians and gays and and black families that I see play, or in all families play, and sometimes that role turns into caregiver of the elderly members of the family. Uh, sometimes that role is is uh, caregiver of children who, for whatever reason, may not have parents that can fulfill all of those parental responsibilities, and and particularly in the black family, everyone has always been involved with nurturing and um, you know so I mean and so it, it was important to have my whole family to be supportive of me too. And they were supportive after you came out on television. I want to ask Chancellor Levy from the University of Illinois Urbana, do you have students coming to you who are debating whether or not to come out to their parents and you don't tell them to come out on television do you? Uh, well we don't normally advise that as the first spot. <laughs> uh, no I would say that. We do find in a college population we're a residential campus uh, most of our students come, they come in the fall and stay with us throughout the entire school year. And the process of coming out for many of them is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, the lack of support of family then gets played out by the kind of support they can find within the student community, uh, with professional staff, with faculty and staff role models, people with whom they can identify and feel some support as they begin to work through the process of who they are what they are and allowing themselves to to remove this the the burden of the the hidden burden that has uh, probably weighed many of them down fortunately i think in our college community it is possible and probably more comfortable than it would be in some other kinds of communities where they might be located but aren't all children struggling with all kinds of problems when they're at your campus Oh, sure. Is, how unique oh, is sure. this? How unique is this in terms of being a well, problem? Well, I think it's probably more troubling than some of the other issues because in most cases the student probably has not come out previously because of the lack of support or assistance at home. So the, the student comes to the college campus, discovers, yes, there are other people such as me around who can provide me with some support, and that becomes, if you will, the new family to provide that what I'd say was the transitional stage from where they had been in high school living in the, under the proverbial umbrella of the, fan, the parent, the maternal, paternal home, to what they want to become. Right. So Jewish children get the support of Jewish parents around that issue, I would assume, Rabbi. I would hope. Uh, <laughs> black <laughs> children get the support around being black in a racist society, Congressman Washington. But what about the gay child? What kind of support do they get from their families, Kevin Barrow, from the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force? You deal with the issue of violence, too. Does violence ever occur around this issue? Absolutely. Uh, there's a considerable body of data to show that many lesbian and gay youth are battered by their family members, parents, siblings, peers at school, when they reveal or when their parents find out their sexual orientation. My experience was pretty fortunate in that my parents were very accepting, and it was a good thing, because everything I'd ever heard about gay and lesbian people growing up was that they were sick, sinful, predatory people who were incapable of loving or being loved. And I'd made a vow to myself that if I was still queer by the time I was 17, I was going to hang myself with a necktie. Mm. And it wasn't, if it wasn't for the fact that my parents were loving and accepting towards me, 
that I, I don't know that I would have, the story of my life would have been much different and perhaps much shorter. And Judge Richard Fehler from the Supreme Court of the State of New York, when you were 11 years old, you tried to find out about this. You tried to go to the library in Queens, New York, to find out about what it is to be a homosexual. What did you find in the library? What year was that? Well, <laughs> that was quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. And everything that I read was totally, totally negative. And I decided that I would not act out on my feelings and that I would try and live a straight life. But we were talking about family and family staying together and what brought me out to my parents is that I fell in love and I felt that I wanted to share my lover with my family. And I felt that if they couldn't accept him, then we wouldn't have a family anyway. But it is sort of a catch-22 because you love your family and you're afraid you're going to lose them if you come out to them. And when you don't come out to them, you separate your life from them and you get further and further away from them anyway and you tend to lose them anyway. So, so what you end up doing is you end up hiding. And Paulette Goodman in our cover story talked about that. And she compared hiding in Nazi-occupied France to what her gay child goes through in America in terms of hiding. Now that's an analogy. A lot of people in the audience are saying, hey, how dare you compare what people went through under the Nazis to what people are going through in America because they're gay or lesbian. But does that analogy work for you, Rabbi Schindler? Well, it certainly does. Uh, we are both of us victims, victims of prejudice, victims of uh, hatred. Uh, hatred knows no boundaries. Hatred knows no limits. And, Why are uh, people in the audience making a distinction on that sometimes? Well, I mean, all analogies have their flaws, uh, but uh, d definitely uh, in, in, at its root. Uh, just before it was, uh, while we were assembling in the green room, Justice uh, Fehler uh, showed us, uh, I believe, a, um, a triangle from Buchenwald. Uh, uh, he has it right there. Which film? Uh, this is what uh, the uh, gay uh, victims of the Nazis had to wear uh, when they were slaughtered. Uh, curiously enough, this triangle, if you uh, uh, superimpose another triangle on it, it becomes the Star of David. Uh, we were both victims in Buchenwald, so I'm not shocked by this analogy. And this is not just a symbol, yes. this is something that people actually wore in the concentration and camps. This we is we suffered together, we were all victims together, and therefore we are all together, uh, blacks, Jews, uh, uh, gays, lesbians, uh, homosexuals in, in the struggle for the civil rights of all people. Abby Rubenfeld, you're out there in Tennessee, a lawyer. You say you're the only openly gay lawyer in Tennessee. How does that analogy work for you? Is that something that you would use in trying to convince people that this is something that uh, they should uh, try to understand more, that how the parallels work? I would use that analogy. I think that that's a very clear analogy, and I think um, an important point is the institutionalized uh, discrimination and hatred that is still allowed and encouraged in this country. Right now, in a community outside of Nashville, a city council is considering legislation, uh, fair housing legislation, where they're going to increase protections for various uh, classes of people who are discriminated against. And they want this city council in the city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, wants to write into their law a specific exclusion for gay men and lesbians. They want to say, they want to specifically in a law allow landlords to discriminate against people that they perceive to be gay or lesbian. And the fact that a legislature, a legislative body in our country in 1991 would consider adopting legislation to specifically discriminate is abhorrent to me. It's ridiculous and... A lot of people it, don't think this is a serious issue, but you have a chain of restaurants out there in Tennessee called the Cracker Barrel. Do you want to tell us about mm -hmm. that? Well, we have a... It's, it's a chain of <laughs> restaurants that's headquartered in Tennessee, but it's throughout the southeast and actually in other parts of the country. I think there's 96 restaurants in the chain, and they too have adopted an official, overt, direct policy of discrimination, saying that any gay or lesbian employees, or people who are suspected of being gay or lesbian, will be fired or will not be hired. Um, they put that policy out in a press release and sent that out to the public. Again, in 1991, that any company, a corporation in the United States of America that would adopt an official policy of discrimination is beyond belief, but it's still happening. People are losing their jobs. Well because of that. Judge, I probably don't have to show you this, but this is the Constitution of the United States, equal protection under the law. Is this constitutional, what the Cracker Barrel is doing, what the people out there are doing in Tennessee and elsewhere in the United States? Is it legal? <coughs> legal discrimination? Well, I think, unfortunately, in our country today, it still is legal. And our country has gone through much, and I think we've drawn some analogies when we talked together before, 
about what happened to other groups in America. And at one time, the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case said that it was, you know, the rights of blacks don't exist. And that certainly has changed. And I think it will change with us, but we have to work very hard and we have to get other people to work with us in coalition. And I think that's one of the things we're talking about tonight. Mark Loveless. One thing, um, it's not just Cracker Barrel, and Cracker Barrel is, is very blatant, but there are other companies that, that do things, major companies. One of them in Michigan is um, EDS, uh, EDI, EDS, the... Um, the uh, Gotta get it straight, we're gonna get sued. <laughs> okay. Uh, and they're an affiliate of, of General Motors, which we had some dialogue with previously, but EDS has a clause that's called something, in other words, it primarily says that if, if you're involved with something in your personal life that they feel is not uh, acceptable, that those are terms of, of being dismissed. Well, now that has, now they have hundreds of gays and lesbians working there, whether they know it or not, who are in, who are in, in major positions. And, and they're afraid to come out because they're afraid to lose their jobs. So it, it's the, the overt thing is good because we can confront that like we did with GM. When, when, well, it was an employment issue. Well, it turned to an employment issue. It was General Motors and the faculty truck thing. And then they turned that, uh, that whole thing around. And, and now they have a policy that talks about fair employment practices and stuff like that. OK, Congressman Washington, people are starting to, talk about, starting to talk about civil rights laws, about comparing it with the movement for black civil rights. A uh, woman in the piece talked about that, compared that. I heard the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech, I was moved. I compare that to this. Does that analogy work for you? Sure. I mean, there's no difference between them. You're saying sure. Do you think that the people in Houston feel that way? Houston, where they had a gay and lesbian rights law, they put it on a referendum, and it was defeated nine to one. That's right. uh, there was a coalition between the KKK and the Black Baptist ministers against that law. So where well, does that come from? Unfortunately, in, in, there's, a, there's a difference between, um, I don't see anything funny. It's not um, it's um, scary. There, um, there, there's a, a difference that people attempt to draw uh, between different forms of discrimination. But um, if anyone allows themselves to be divided from other people who are discriminated against by being told that they're different, then we're right back where we started. Uh, there are people who need to feel better than somebody, whether it's gays or blacks or Jewish people or whomever, and there are less of them than there are us, but as long as they keep the gay movement over here and the feminist movement over here, and the, you know, we're losing, we're, we're falling back in general. There was a uh, as far as civil rights are concerned. The judge was talking about the Constitution. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not in the Constitution. Unfortunately, it's politically popular right now to be down on somebody. But, you know, as long as we let them divide us from each other, then, then uh, we're saps. We ought to do something about it. Uh, we ought to stop talking in one little circle and realize that the only thing that's going to ever work to secure rights and to keep rights it was a coalition. We don't have to like that, each other. Is that what got you going on this, Congressman Washington, and got you involved in this issue? Was, no. there anything, was there anything personal that, in your experience? Because obviously a lot of your colleagues don't feel the same way that you do. Well, yeah, very simply. Uh, my mother made me believe that the sun came up in my pocket. Mm. And um, I was seven years old in a mm. Woolsworth store, and I could read because she taught me to read and write before I started school, and I saw white and colored. And I asked her what the difference was. And um, she had sheltered me. And she started crying. And she took me home. And it took a while. And then I started to notice that I walked past one school to go to another school. And I started noticing differences. I never thought I was inferior. I thought perhaps, you know, I didn't, I didn't think that we were being divided for that reason. But it, no, no specific experience. I always assumed that what the Constitution said it meant for everybody, not but this group of but that group, and I still do. There's no way that I could advocate on behalf of rights for black people without advocating on behalf of rights for all people. Okay. That's the way Congressman Washington feels. What about on the campuses today? This is a hot issue today. It sure is. ROTC, get them off campus because they discriminate against gay people. That's one of the issues. And there's all this uh, debate over politically correct speech, which involves gays and lesbians, Chancellor Levy. What are you finding? Is this on your campus a hot issue? Oh, I think it's, I think I'd, I'd be very supportive of what the Congressman has just said. Uh, I didn't originate the phrase, but it came to me a long time ago. People who hate don't discriminate. 
against whom they're hating or with whom they're hating. And as a consequence, it means that when it comes to matters of rights, uh, people of like minds have to forget about the little differences that maybe we don't like this guy or that guy or that person or the other person, but if you're going to talk rights, it really means there needs to be the coalescence or coalition or whatever of a coming together. The, That's and very the, hard uh, to do, though. La Larry Kramer, you co-founded the Gay Men's Health Crisis. You're one of the founders of ACT UP, big activist group across the nation. What do you have to say I'm about just this? Saying, it's very hard to, fun, to form coalitions. It's always been hard to form coalitions, and I think that's one reason movements uh, burn out, um, which is unfortunate. And it makes sense on paper, but it's just very hard to do. I'm, I'm with the congressman. I think we're right back where we started from. I don't see uh, the I see the gay mo and lesbian movement in big trouble. I see the black and people of color movement in terrible trouble. I see feminism. All the all the gains, Rabbi uh, Schindler, you're shaking your head. You don't I'm think these movements are in I trouble? Because I think that the only way we can move forward if we forge coalitions of decency on oh, all I agree. issues. I agree. Uh, we should, but the, I'm just the, saying it's impossible the, to there do. There was a song in the '60s, I think, which still applies, a civil rights song. We're in the same boat, brother. We're the same boat, brother. And when you oh, shake Rabbi, one end, you're going to rock the words. other. Those are just words. Those are just wonderful words. Those are not words. just words. Well, I it's think just, I'm that just telling you, it never seems to happen. It seems to me that progress was made on the civil rights front precisely because there were collisions between blacks and Jews on the American, uh, on the American scene. Jewel Gomez, go, go, go ahead. One of the things I think that, that Larry's responding to is this sort of the sense of burning out. If you work in the movement for a number of years, I mean, I can date my first civil rights action um, to 1963 um, in Boston, uh, where we had Blackout Day, you know, and so for almost 30 years my life has been committed to some sort of civil rights action of one sort or another. This is nothing new for you. So at this point you begin to wonder um, when do I get to sit down? You don't get to sit <laughs> you know, down. You know, or if I sit, sit down. down. Con Congressman Washington? You don't get to sit down. That's just the point. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we have to stop. We have to keep going. I mean we didn't make out, of, I mean, it took a hell of a long time to get from Dred Scott in, 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 in 19, uh, 1896 to 1954, but there were black people and, and, and Hispanic people and, and Jewish people and, and old people and young people and gay people and straight people then, back then, working to get to the point where black people would even vote. Now, now people don't want to vote. But the point is we get some people who get complacent because they accomplish some things, Larry. I mean, you get black people who do well in society, you get gay people. They forget about the fact that there are other people back there. But we, we can't stop having coalitions. We may as well say that the Constitution doesn't mean a damn thing if we're going to give up on it. I agree with you. I just say it is very hard to but we have form to keep coalitions. Trying. Let me finish. Right. Have uh, let me finish. Oh, no, no, what, what, one at a time, one at a time. I, I started ACT UP. My issue is basically not gay rights. My issue that I feel passionately about is AIDS research. AIDS is hitting a lot of people besides gay people. It's been exceedingly hard to draw in anybody besides gay people, and not so many of them, to fight this fight. And uh, so... Is that true all over the country? No, is that, not is true. that true in Detroit, Mark Loveless? No, I, I, you know, I, I, under, I do understand where Larry's coming from, but I think that, that we can't ignore the fact that we have had some victories. The, I mean, particularly within the 100th session of the Congress, we passed the hate crimes bill. We passed the hate the, crimes bill. Maybe we can get Kevin Barrell to right. since he played a very large has role not in the play. Any. Well, <clears throat> Kevin. Barrell but as an illustration of any. successful coalition building, this was an was it. was an yeah. array of religious civil rights, law enforcement, professional yeah. groups that came together. Yeah, really and the understanding from the get-go yeah, yeah. is that it was all for one and one for all. Exactly. That, that our, our allies, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Congress, the NAACP, the, and other groups agreed that if there was an attempt, as there was, to remove sexual orientation from this bill that would require the federal government to collect data on hate crimes, that this bill, will be, this bill would be pulled. And as it happened, we, we succeeded. It was the first federal law ever to include a sexual orientation provision. And the signing of that law marked the first time that lesbian and gay activists were ever at a presidential signing ceremony. Right. And that's meanwhile, right, at the same right, time, the amount of gay bashing and lesbian bashing has increased, um, anti-gay violence has increased to all but, time highs. the words right out of my mouth. Well, the bill but passes, that is, ironically. Hold it. The bill passes. The statistics go through the roof, so we're collecting statistics. on What effect does it have? Statistics two, for a president who does not give a good GD about AIDS, about anti, about gays and lesbians, about people of color, 
about you name it. He cares about middle class, upper class, white, heterosexual men, zilch, I, I, but period. My position is I don't care what he cares about because well, what, I'm, what, what I'm more concerned about is what's happening in my community. And the fact that we have a hate crime statistics gathering bill uh, a act that's part of law, it means that the law enforcement officials in Adrian, Michigan, which, which conducted uh, uh, sting operations against gays and lesbians, are going to have to be accountable. It means Detroit police officers who, are, who went into gay bars just a year ago and were pulling people out and caused a major ruckus are going to have to be accountable okay. some way. If they don't report it, we'll report it. And the, and the Justice Department the law says that it must be reported. But it's even more than that. We passed the ADA bill. The, uh, ADA, uh, Americans uh, with Disabilities American, American Act. Disabilities okay, Act. we passed some legislation. We passed right. some legislation. No, we can no, get out. All of that Mark, was done me. under that. Go ahead. Well, good luck. Uh, uh, under the same the law thing is going to protect you. About. Good right. luck. I want to go back to the heartland. I want to go back to Abby Rubenfeld out there in Tennessee, the only, says, the only openly gay or lesbian lawyer <laughs> in yeah, Tennessee. I'd love it if you'd find another now, one. <laughs> 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 you, you, also, you also said in an interview, it took 17 years to pass the gay and lesbian rights law in Massachusetts, one of four states in this country that protect lesbian and gay civil rights. You said it might take 117 years in the state of Tennessee. Why hasn't anybody followed your example in Tennessee, the other attorneys out there? Well, the reality in this country in 1991 is that there is a tremendous amount of discrimination still based on sexual orientation. And in my state, you can lose your job, you can lose your children, you can lose your life, you can lose your home, you can lose everything if you come out and acknowledge that you're gay or lesbian. But the flip side of that the is... The going to do real good in well, Tennessee. <laughs> Why hasn't it no, happened to you, Abby? Well, the flip side of that is that if, we, if more of us <laughs> do come out, I think that more of us will be able to change the minds of people around us. When people, when people are more aware of us, when we're less invisible, I think that we do start to change people, and that we, will start to change... Do we, see that, do we see that happening? Action. We have two openly gay members of Congress. Yeah. We have Barney Frank and Gary Studs from Massachusetts. Yeah. We haven't seen any... Uh, run for everybody else to come out of the closet who's in, who's in Washington, in, in, among your colleagues. If 10% of the population is gay, there ought to be a little bit more than two out of 435 or 535 That's right, in the whole but Congress. So what's the atmosphere in Congress around these issues? Why would your colleagues be so afraid to come out or even support gay and lesbian rights? It's not politically popular, but that's the point. We have not? to make it politically popular because it takes a lot of courage for a candidate to stand up and, and say that he or she is uh, of a different sexual persuasion or orientation. And it takes a certain amount of courage, although it shouldn't take any for any of this, for a candidate to come out and, and, and openly support, support gay and lesbian issues. Because, because John Q. Citizen out there needs a long explanation, and you can't give it in a 30-second soundbite, and that's what campaigns have come down to. Larry Kramer? Well, well, well I think the, 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 candidate, the closeted candidate who runs and doesn't come out is immoral and lying. I would rather have a straight candidate who supports my issues like you than a closeted gay or lesbian who is ducking the issues all the time as most of the closeted gay and lesbian people that we have elected to but office more, starting in this city and going right straight through to Congress. You're right, but more fundamentally than that is the point that, that it needs to become an issue in political campaigns. We need to get people, the only way that, that, that gay and, 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 and lesbian rights will be ever talked about on the floor of Congress is for the, the groundswell to come from the people. When politicians think that it's politically well, popular... When 25 to million to gay people right, sign a list and change. are visible, you're Roberta absolutely Roberta right. Roberta Actenberg, you, you felt... Say something about 40 years of political activism in the place that I come from. It, and it's taken basically that long. It's taken longer than that, in fact. I come from San Francisco. We have had self-conscious, gay-identified political activism in my town for more than 40 years now. And it's just beginning um, to have a real impact on, on the electorate, on our elected representatives. Um, they must make gay and lesbian rights an issue. It's no longer possible for them to exist politically without paying at least some lip service to us as a community. And that is not to say that we have all the rights that we need or all the rights that we must aspire to, but it is to say that it takes that much political activism. It takes um, that long. It takes that much work. It takes that much coalition building and more. 
many of us don't have a choice about um, building coalitions artificially. We are lesbians. We are, I'm Jewish, I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, uh, you know, Jewel's a black person. We're talking about uh, integrating ourselves with other part of ourselves and the various communities that we come from. It's a matter of developing political sophistication. It's a matter of being out there and being visible. It's doing work around um, gay and lesbian issues, not apologizing for it, not being apologetic about it, and going and talking directly to politicians and saying, this is who I am, this is who we are, this is what we demand of you. Supervisor Actenberg in San Francisco, that's what's happening. And that's where people probably think it should happen, out in San Francisco. What about in, if this happened in well, Urbana, I think, I think that's how a, would this be I think received? That's, a, that's kind of a stupid attitude, um, with all due respect. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not... It's happening a lot of other places as well. I'm only talking but it about... Happening, it is happening as well as it is in San Francisco. Yeah, well, if you... After, yeah, and it will after people have been out and doing it and developing skills and coalition building for 40 years, you will see progress in a lot of other places Everybody's we already have. Everybody's not ahead this is going to happen. But you know what, in Detroit. In Albany, and, uh, I, I, two things to not, to not forget. We introduced the uh, Lesbian Gay mm -hmm. Civil Rights Bill this, with this session having the highest number of co-sponsors as, as ever before, and an overwhelming number of those members. We, had, we got a major uh, percentage of the... Um, of the freshman members to, to, to co-sponsor it. Something else not for it's not just San Francisco. We elected, what, two years ago, the first openly gay black official in, in Albany, New York. So, I mean, it, it, it is beginning to happen. I mean, candidates are running in, in other places all through America. And Judge Fela, you're the first openly gay elected judge in the state of New York. It took a long time for that to happen. Well, I don't know that it took a long time. I don't know that anybody aspired to it much earlier. <laughs> And so maybe it might have happened earlier if somebody pushed for it. But you opened the program dating our movement from 1969. It probably dates back further than that, but not much further considering that there has been a sanction to hate us for 2,000 years. And so if we make change... Maybe longer. In, maybe longer. But if we even say 2,000 years, then we're talking about a lot of change very quickly. Just this show indicates that there are is a lot of change and has been a lot of change. There are people who may be impatient with that, who feel tired and burned out. But we have accomplished a lot. And we talked earlier, and we each agreed that to accomplish more, we would need to have more people come out. That when people recognize, when people out there in the heartland of America recognize that they know and love somebody that is gay, right. that will begin to change their attitudes. Okay. Visibility right. is certainly going to change things. You want to suggest something else, Mr. Barrow? The consequences of visibility are clear. It leads to greater self-esteem and less stress in our personal lives. It, it allows us to build families, institutions, communities. It, the, the advantages are, are immense, but visibility has a price, and I think Larry was getting to that point, because every time an oppressed community starts to become more visible and vocal and assertive. There's a backlash. We saw that during the black civil rights movement in the 60s. We see it continuing in, in the rise of racist violence today. There was tremendous progress during that period in the 60s at the same time that black churches were being firebombed and civil rights workers were being murdered and freedom riders were being beaten. And today, in les lesbian and gay Americans are, are experience everything ranging from harassment to homicide. So that while I think as we look to the future, we're going, to be, we're going to be seeing both increased acceptance and empowerment on the one hand and increased violent backlash on the other. That, that bigotry does not, dies, a, dies hard. So, since other communities went through this and have gone through it before, what can we learn from the other movements, Mr. Kramer? I think we're avoiding the nitty-gritty here, which is that we're allowing an awful lot of what happens to us to exist ourselves, and that every person who remains in the closet is helping to kill every person who is out of the closet. And this is particularly true now in the case of AIDS, where we're 10 years into a plague and where very little progress has been made and we still know practically next to nothing about an illness that is going to decimate potentially 20 million people by the end of this century. And uh, that's very scary. And when I see all that, I don't see any progress, you know? I want to get back to something that we, that uh, the, a point that, that, uh, it, that we talked of earlier, which is the family business. And I felt a little uncomfortable. Everybody's extolling the family as some holier-than-thou thing that is so wonderful. A lot of people don't want families. A lot of people don't like families. A lot of people went through hell with families. Uh, and you're looking at one. 
and uh, and I don't feel all the warmth haven't you toward found, Haven't you found a gay and lesbian family of my friends? My friends are my family. Are your family? But, but that's you use a the different word issue. Family. That's a different issue. Well, sure and it's taken sure me a long either. time, and it's taken me a long time to get my own family to come around to the support of things that we see uh, in this film here. Yeah. But I get a little, it gets a little too saccharine. I do want to pick up on Larry's point because we haven't talked a lot about it tonight. How AIDS has changed this movement, even in Tennessee, Abby Rubenfeld? Well, obviously it's changed the movement, even in Tennessee. I mean, people are getting sick and dying in Tennessee as they are in every other place mm -hmm. in this country. And it's changed, it's changed the movement, it's changed the emphasis of uh, people who are active, it's changed priorities, it's taken energy. Um, people that would have maybe worked to introduce a gay and lesbian civil rights bill, even in Tennessee, are working on AIDS issues because people are dying every day and we want to do something about that. Larry Kramer's absolutely right. Not enough attention has been focused on this issue. In my state, no state money goes for AIDS research or for anything to do with AIDS. No when state we get money. To the coalition thing, I mean, here's a good case in point. You know, uh, I'm a Jew. The, the, uh, the, 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 the Jewish people who have been through a Holocaust would think you would recognize another Holocaust. And I haven't seen so much support on the AIDS issue from, from the Jewish religion, quite frankly, Rabbi. And you might take that back to your fellows and girls. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that's so. It occurs to me that we have a rather interesting example here. Uh, five of the <coughs> ten panelists are Jews. Uh, four of them, incidentally, are Catholics, and we only have one wasp well, among us. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I think we are disproportionately <laughs> represented in this coalition of decency, which but is Rabbi, right around the table. But Rabbi, what about Larry's, we made an earlier analogy to hiding from the Nazis. What yeah. about the Holocaust of AIDS? How does that analogy well, work? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, the Jewish community is supportive and ought to be supportive of that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we've certainly spoken out very clearly. Uh, our movement, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, which is the largest uh, Jewish religious community in the, uh, on the American scene, on the North American scene, has uh, uh, been most supportive of this maybe issue. You could, maybe you could uh, maybe. say a few words to Noach Deer over there across the river. I mean, Noach Deer is the, the one who... Did. Yeah. Joel, Joel, let me ask Joel Gomez. Uh, He's the one who doesn't recognize me as a Jew. <laughs> but did you, did you? <laughs> I just Jewel, suddenly like Jew. <laughs> Jewel Gomez, did you feel, in terms of growing up black in Boston, support the support that was out there from the Jewish community, and do you feel the same support from the Jewish community around the gay and lesbian issue? Of course, it was a major part of, of the civil rights movement and the whole the whole sense of cooperation, I think, w was something that grew naturally out of the labor movement. Um, and I think at this point in our history, we are just beginning as gay people to identify ethnically, to understand what it means to go back to our own ethnic communities and to pull that support in. I mean, one of the most significant things that has happened with um, the AIDS activism has been a development of coalitions in the lesbian and gay community such as we have not seen before and in fact attempts of which in the past divided the gay and lesbian movement terribly in the 70s so that ACT UP and other organizations that are specifically have been specifically AIDS related have brought people together who you never would have thought would come together so that the energy the time where I feel like I want to sit down I begin to be re-energized because I now see a group of men with whom I deal that I never would have dealt with before or who never would have looked me in the eye before. And I think that is something that if we can carry it over, and I think it's a direct follow-up from the Civil Rights Movement. So we build a coalition. We need an agenda for that coalition. You want to get in this first, Yes, I want to go back Fella? a little bit because, you know, it's, it's very unrealistic to talk about us and them and Jews and blacks and then talk about gays as if we were separate. Because we are everywhere and we are everyone. If we are gay and lesbian, we are black gays and lesbians, we're Jewish gays and lesbians, we're wasp gays and lesbians. And it, we, to take that out of that context is to miss the whole picture. Now maybe we have to go back to our own communities from which we come and come out more. In some communities it may even be more difficult to do so than in other communities. But we, we, keep, but we, we need to recognize that it isn't us and them, that we are a part of all. We keep talking about coming out. We keep talking about building a coalition. What's on the agenda? What does the gay and lesbian community want? And how are, how are the non-gay people well, here going to help? Well, one, 
you know, Mark Loveless. I, I, I think I think a couple of things. I th the issue of going back to your community and coming out. That the, there's another issue for the black gay community, and that is coming out where you are because we we don't th the black gay community is not as mobile by nature. Um, we don't go out. It's difficult to go out and then to to come out someplace. We have to deal with coming out where where we are. Um, you, and, and as far as the response, our, the black community has been responsive uh, to the to the AIDS issue. Where we, we have not. Well, Where? I, th well, I think the I mean, U.S. This city? The, the this US, city? Well, I don't know about so it's this a city. Scandal. I don't, well, I don't it's know scandal about in this Washington. city though. I, what I know mm -hmm. about is I know that in Detroit we have an office that's set up for AIDS education. I know that in Michigan. I, I know that also in Detroit, we also have an organization that specifically caters to servicing people with AIDS. A couple of them. Um, I'm still so, trying. To, still trying to get more. Okay. To the what is on the agenda, Chancellor the, Levy, get into this. Okay. What are the young people on your campus telling you? The gays and lesbians that are coming to you. What are they saying that they want? They want probably more than anything else an opportunity to be themselves, to be who they are. What does that mean? Well, they, they don't want to have to hide. They don't want to have to be victimized. They don't want to be battered. They want to be able to be the kind of person they, they think they are. What are they doing to, to bring that about? I think well, I think... Find a common denominator. And um, I'm not sure that we have yet, but it seems to me that uh, we need to... I mean, if you go back to the 60s, there were a lot of things happening there, but there were certain things that acted as a catalyst that, that jump things up another gear. I mean, it's, I know where you're coming from. It's awfully frustrating to be told to wait. We need, we need to devote more time and attention and money to AIDS when it's killing people every day. But, but look at the black community. The black community is in terrible state sure right it now. Is. How can, I mean, all the gains of the 60s have been lost. Exactly. And I see the same thing happening in the gay community, exactly. quite frankly. The That's AIDS right. activist exactly. movement, right. which is just almost falling but apart. But my point is that we have a common denominator. So what? Big deal. We had it then. So, well, we don't. We don't have it right now. But what there is one then, we ought to take it and go forward. But how? I mean, I keep it. These are you, the two of you are such goody goodies. I keep hearing all these wonderful things. I want concrete congestions. What do I'll you take, been, I'll take I have the, been the spending ten, of being the last ten goody years goody trying the first to form time coalition. <laughs> <laughs> how about? How about? How about? Uh, that was the first time he's ever been called a goody goody. I mean, I take the compliment. How about finding one issue, such as the civil rights bill, that we could all call around? What about around? the civil That's rights right. bill in because Congress? Because the Americans with Disabilities Act, as you very That's well right. know, was compromised, and it's right instead of going forward with a full bill and just laying it out there like it was, Congress ended up compromising the bill and then incorporated by reference the whatever remedies were available to a person who's discriminated against because they're Jewish or black or whatever. So it seems to me that the disabled community and, 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 and the gay community and, and the black community and the feminist community, all these communities we've been talking about have one thing in common. Because gay, if we get civil rights, if we can get our civil four rights lousy in force, lobbyists in Washington. then more people are likely to come out. Nobody's going to, who's going to come out when, when they, they, they have a $40,000 a year job and some health insurance and they're going to end up losing it? That's crazy. I agree. You have to, you I have, agree. But not but everybody doesn't have the courage. Tell me how. Wait, Abby Rubenfeld wants to get into something this. Something else into this that's even more basic than losing your job, your forty thousand dollar year job. In twenty five states in this country, including my own in Tennessee, people can still be put in jail because they're gay or lesbian if they act out on that because of their sexual behavior. Um, and this but, was upheld by the Supreme Court in right. 1986. That's right. Case, that's so. right. In a Georgia case, very recently. Well, in the Texas case was along with it. Um, so and that's your answer. Well, that to me is a very basic issue. That's something we need to no, do. Something at that it we too can't. Narrowly. Right. We can't. You just, just picked out that. a gay issue. Why don't pick one that we all can agree with? Then you don't have to go and beg people to coalesce with you. Is my point. Give me one. I thought AIDS would that's do it. I thought. Right. I, I thought when AIDS. I, know, when I thought when AIDS Larry. hit the first child that the Congress would pay attention to it. But they, they didn't, have, and you know it, and I know it, right. and we're okay. still sitting around talking about it when we could be or doing it. another hold, issue. Take, take a break. We're trying to find out what's on the table. What does the gay and lesbian community want? And we know certainly what, what the gay and lesbian community wants in terms of AIDS. What's on the political agenda in Washington, and how is it making progress, Kevin Barrow? Access to health care, and that's an issue around which we all need to coalesce. Right. It's not just funding for AIDS. The, the medical system in this country is, is in ruins, and a third of all Americans don't even have access to decent health care. And that's an issue around which all of us, um, regardless of our background or identity, have a, an enormous stake in. 
the right of all people, regardless of their status or identity, to live without violence or the, th or, or the threat of violence. The, the right to decent and affordable housing. The right to live in an environment that isn't choked with pollution. And I don't have to see Forsythia blooming in Washington, D.C. in early February when it used to bloom in March. Global warming, <laughs> you know, that, that, that those are the basic issues and those are issues in which gay men and lesbians, among many others, have an enormous stake in. I think I see, I guess, from what I sense is, I see that people, the, the movement has almost left those of us who are uh, activists in positions of, of responsibility. It's, I think the, the fact that when you talk the about... Left, is there a generation gap or something? I don't, it, it may not only be generational, I think it's just as far as the agenda for, for the average gay family or gay, gay person has been the family issue. Lesbians and gays are going into county clerks and city, uh, city clerk's offices and saying, recognize, acknowledge our relationships. That is uncoordinated by any real national movement. That's happening from the grassroots. So family issues has got to be primary number one in the hearts of, of lesbians and gays, second to violence. And then, and I think the health, I think if we can, I think the, the thought might be is that if we can deal, if you can ex acknowledge our relationships, give us the same rights, and, and, and to remove the fear of violence from us, and thus allowing us to, to live our lives fully, we can deal with other things as, and, as Ms. Scott and that Roberta, might be. We are already Actenberg. dealing with those things, though, is yeah. my point. We're, we're, there are gay and lesbian people working on health, environmental, reproductive freedom issues. We're doing the work, but many of us are doing it in the closet. Because uh, we're not self-identifying uh, whether we're lesbian or gay or bisexual or whatever, uh, but the work is happening, and it has been well, happening. Larry's right. This all does sound rather goody-goody. Who could be against the things that we're talking about exactly. here, Jewel Gomez? Who could be, a, who them, could be against issue. these things? Well, well, and everyone, why are people against everyone them? Everyone who understands that all of these requests, desires, needs have economic answers that come behind them. Because every time a gay or a lesbian person says in their business, I want my spouse to benefit from my health insurance, right. just like a heterosexual couple is able to do. It means it may cost the company money. Every time um, the green movement says, I want some accountability on what's going to happen with toxic waste, it means some corporation has to spend money to figure out what we happens have, with it. It has to be made profitable in order to get gay and lesbian rights? Capitalism is not going capitalism to suddenly is the answer? Going to decide. Money no, is capitalism power. is not suddenly hmm. going to decide. It's acceptable for any of these things as long as it costs money in this culture. Roberta Actenberg, is that what made the difference, money, in San Francisco when you granted domestic partner benefits to gay and lesbian couples there? Well, that, was, that had something to hmm. do with it. We had to persuade people that money was not a significant issue. Well, that it wasn't going to cost just any money. Just a minute. But, but um, I think that it was only, that was only secondary to whether or not people had already been persuaded uh, that the love between a lesbian and her partner, a gay man and his partner, or the love um, that had been expressed by so many toward their friends. And I think the AIDS epidemic had a big impact on enhancing the visibility of the way in which many of us take care of our extended families. People were already persuaded um, that the love was worthy of recognition. Uh, and then uh, the economic uh, an answers could be, could be given. I think money has something to do with it. And people's objective circumstances we clearly are... We have as a powerful, rich community. There's no question that, that we've had to raise... To spend, there's no question that we we've had to raise even money. If, even if people aren't we've rich, we're that. talking about people being visible. And yet, and yet, African Americans are very pressure. visible in this country. What? African Americans are very visible in this country. We've talked about visibility all night. African Americans are very visible in this country, and we can't pass a simple civil rights bill in the Congress. So no, is visibility, no, the, is visibility the whole answer, Jewel, Jewel Gomez? It is perceived as a powerful community. And I think it's taken <coughs> many years for there to be any perception of Afro-Americans as a powerful voting bloc, and which seems to have fallen apart in recent years. If and I it's may. yet to be, uh, the situation is yet to come where the gay and lesbian community is perceived as a powerful voting exactly. bloc with any kind of influence in this exactly. culture. Exactly, and that's the problem. The, the, problem. Congress, bottom, Congress the bottom Russia. line is that it's become fashionable to be prejudiced in this country. Mm. It cuts through all Thank the you, other George BS. Bush. It's mm -hmm. fashionable to become, to, to be, t ten years ago people wouldn't say the things out loud. It wasn't fashionable to say them. Oh, we haven't had any leadership at the top. I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican. 
You need uh, somebody in this country who's willing to stay, stand forward and say, I am your leader, right. and we're not going to tolerate okay. prejudice, whether it's against gays or blacks. Or, I mean, but it's all right to do that. And that's why you see violence. Young kids think they can go down the street and beat somebody okay. up because they happen to be a different color. I want to hear something a little bit more positive. Congressman, you, you, came, you, you came here. man should run for president. You, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's good. Maybe that's good. I'll come work for you. And I'm and I'm going to give you and I'm going to give you the last word, Congressman Washington. You, you came you came here from from Washington from a from a district was not necessarily pro-gay. Why did you come here tonight to be on this panel? Because it's important. It's important that people who elected the public office stand up and say what they mean and talk directly to the the people. There are people all over this country who are gay, and they are all colors, and they're all sizes, and they're all shapes, and they're people just like everybody else. And if any, if this is America, and the lady at the beginning of the program said that she came here to escape prejudice. She didn't, she, she may have come here looking to escape prejudice, but we have, we're the only people who can stop this country from being prejudiced. We have to realize that regardless of how we divide ourselves into God's little acre here or there, who, who we like or who we don't like, none of us are free until all of us are free. If there's any group of people who's put off in a category and discriminated against, right. then it affects all of us. Thank you very much, and thank you all very much. Tonight we've seen how the gay and lesbian rights movement has grown over the past 20 years in its struggle to take its place alongside the other civil rights movements of the 20th century. To our panel, thank you for your insight, perspective on the major issues directly affecting some 20 million lesbians and gay men in the United States. I'm Andy Hum, and this has been Out in America. This program has been made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. This is PBS.